<clears throat> all right. All right. So the webinar is now live. We're going to wait just a minute here before starting. So we start at the top of the hour. All right. We're like the Brady Bunch of real estate investors right here. <laughs> All right, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off here. So first off, I would love to welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Brian Conlon. I'm in, in charge of business development here with Meridian Pacific Properties. Uh, first off, I just wanna thank everyone for being here. I know there's a lot of interesting stuff going on nowadays, and uh, it does mean a lot that you guys took the time to be with us today. Um, the intention of this webinar is to really share about what we're seeing in the single family residential market, specifically in the Memphis area. This is stuff that we're tracking every day and it's something that we would love to share with you guys. Uh, something that's really clear is that we're in a pretty uncertain time and our commitment has really been to be extra communicative with all of you because uh, being that we follow this every day for a living, we understand that not everyone does and we really wanna provide that education to all of you so that you guys can understand what we're seeing um, out there in Memphis. So before we begin, um, I want to just take a moment to introduce everyone on the line. So we have a, we're, we're blessed to have the full leadership team here today. So um, first off, I want to uh, introduce Jordan Varvel, who's our client relationships manager. Um, as I shared on the last webinar, she really handles a lot of the client interface, inside sales support and processing duties for our company. Uh, next up, we have Kent Koykendall, who's the president of Meridian Pacific Properties, and he's really been spearheading and managing the Meridian property management arm and the construction arm of our organization. Uh, we also have my father, Kevin Conlon, who is the co-founder and principal um, based here in San Diego. And we also have uh, Jeff King, who is the other co-founder and principal of Meridian Pacific Properties. He actually relocated out to Memphis a number of years ago and is in charge of all the day-to-day -day operations out there mm -hmm. on site. So today what we're going to do is we're just going to be going around the horn a little bit and giving everyone an opportunity to share a little bit about what we're seeing in property management, in the Memphis market, and in single family residential market, um, really nationally and specific to Memphis in particular. Um, then we're also going to be going through a Q&A session where uh, during this webinar, you're welcome to actually use the chat box. So one housekeeping item is if you click down here in the the chat box, you'll see something pop up on the far right. If you have a question at any point during our presentation, we ask you to please type in your question there. We're not going to answer it in the moment, but at the bottom of the hour, when everyone gets through their report presentation, we'll go back through each question one by one. So with that being said, I would love to turn it over to Kent Koykendall, who's going to give a presentation about uh, the property management and the construction arms of our business. Thanks, Brian. Good morning. Yeah, we just wanted to give an update on the overall um, operations of Meridian on the ground out here and, and what's happening with our rent collections and our tenants and just the ongoing operations. Obviously, there's been a lot of uh, uh, sensational headlines um, in the last couple of months, a lot of worry and angst about rent. You hear about rent strikes, you hear about rent moratoriums, um, you know, one third of clients not paying rents. Um, the good thing, the good news is most of that is uh, hyperbola, and particularly in the Memphis market, uh, we are just not seeing that. In fact, in Memphis, uh, Memphis has already started opening up phase one. Uh, a lot of businesses uh, are back, to getting back to normal. Restaurants are getting back to normal. Uh, our office, in fact, uh, just this week, uh, we've got everyone coming back into the office. Uh, point being is things are getting back to normal. Uh, in Memphis uh, as one of the earlier states, Tennessee and Northern Mississippi. Um, but it, our whole approach to rent collections going into this starting two months ago, once this crisis hit was uh, we were not gonna do any mandatory rent deferrals uh, or base or uh, abatements. In fact, we were just gonna communicate um, with our tenants and make sure they understand uh, what assistance is at their disposal, that rents are still uh, due and collectible and leases in full force, unless on a case by case basis, they have in fact been directly affected uh, by COVID-19 
uh, and their situation uh, is unique and they need some, some help. And therefore we put a process in place um, to provide applications for rent deferrals on an as needed basis. And the first month uh, in April, that turned out very well. Um, in fact, we collected 99.5% of rents uh, in April and in fact, collected them earlier in general than the prior three months. So not quite sure all of the dynamics there, but people were paying their rents, getting that taken care of. Uh, next question was gonna be the month of May. Well, we're, on, we're at the sixth of the month, uh, we're seventh today, but as of the sixth, uh, we're at 90.4% of our rents collected so far for the month. That's a full three percentage points higher than last month. So people that once again, um, are not being affected in their ability to pay rents. And in fact, they seem to be paying a little bit earlier just to make sure that their, their housing is taken care of. Um, you know, why this strong performance in May so far? Well, clearly the government stimulus package that was uh, gone out in April helped with that. Um, and now with the economy starting to open up, I think the confidence level here is starting to increase. So that's kind of the transient circumstances but in general, we are in all class A or mostly class A properties. And those tend to be higher earning tenants that were just not as affected. Uh, their jobs were not as affected as class B and C properties. Uh, we also have very stringent screening uh, practices uh, that helps with that as well. And just in general, we've said it before, and it's still true, the Memphis economy uh, is not based as much in, in uh, the entertainment and hospitality industry but it's much more based in logistics and distribution. And those industries are uh, not really missing a beat. And in fact, FedEx uh, being uh, one of the major employers here in Memphis is going bang gangbusters and uh, keeping a lot of people employed there and certainly keeping the enthusiasm and the confidence level uh, strong in the Memphis area. So Memphis itself is very strong. Uh, looking at June, we just had a conversation uh, this morning, we, we look at a lot of round table. We sit in a lot of round tables, look at a lot of industry reports. You know, there are reports in other markets <coughs> of uh, uncollectibles getting up into the five to eight percent range. We have not seen any of that here. Uh, and talking to our team uh, again this morning, we're looking at June and July as being just as strong as May. Uh, you know, we can't say that with 100 percent confidence. Um, we don't know what twists and turns uh, this pandemic is taking, but as of right now, uh, June and July are looking very strong, just like May. And the big change that has happened just in the last 15, 20 days is the leasing activity has really picked up. Uh, in the last two weeks, we've gotten probably twice the number of applications approved uh, to lease out our new properties, and that's coming on very strong. Part of that is seasonal. Part of it is, you know, the weather uh, improving and picking up, but a lot of it is people, um, you know, there's a little bit of pent-up demand, cabin fever. People are getting into, um, into new properties, and this is where we really see the wind at our back for single-family rentals, where a lot of people, um, and this is kind of an industry-wide trend, moving out of apartments, wanting to move out of apartments into single family homes, wanting to move out of dense urban living into less dense su suburbs and moving, moving out of existing homes into new construction, which of course that is our sweet spot now. So a lot of these things are, are, are working in our favor to increase the uh, velocity of leasing and um, keeping the market very strong. Uh, consequently, we've got, you know, we do a lot of work in this beautiful town of uh, Olive Branch in northern Mississippi uh, over the last year. Uh, we're down to our last five or six or so properties. They're going to lease up very quickly as soon as they come on the market. We won't be back in Olive Branch uh, until probably middle to late of next year. Um, so we've got those last five opening up and we expect those to get leased up uh, very, very quickly. On the maintenance side, uh, Maintenance was a little bit down. I mean, we're doing everything we need to do to keep the properties uh, fully maintained. A little bit of activity dropped off in late February, early March. We did all the essential work, but of course, some of the elective work, some tenants wanted to push that out. That's now starting to pick up. So we're playing a little catch up on maintenance. Um, and just for everyone's uh, benefit, 
Uh, certainly our maintenance techs are going out fully uh, protected with PPE for their protection uh, and the tenant's protection. And then as we move forward the rest of this year, uh, new construction is in absolute uh, uh, full bore mode. Uh, the weather has improved here. This was one of the rainiest uh, winters uh, in memory in Memphis and uh, slowed down our ability to get uh, foundations in the ground. That's now come back gangbusters. And as we said in our couple of other last meetings, uh, we are going to be doubling uh, the number of doubling or even two and a half times uh, build the number of new homes uh, for rent in the Memphis market. So we are moving, moving ahead full steam. Um, looking in the best communities and actually developing land now. And Jeff's gonna talk more about that in a minute where we can actually pick our locations to make sure we've got great properties that are great investments for our, for our uh, investors. So now to share a little bit about that, I'm gonna reintroduce Jeff King, co-founder and principal. And uh, Jeff is a man of many talents and he's fully embedded here in Meridian and uh, he's gonna share a little bit about the future. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> yeah, as uh, Brian had mentioned, I relocated out here. I used to live in California. I relocated about six years ago into the Memphis market. And one of my main uh, goals was to bring focus to the strategic operations of the company and try to figure out, you know, how to take what we have, replicate it, and improve it, you know, going forward. <clears throat> my primary function is to secure and develop the very best investment neighborhoods in the greater uh, Memphis area. But before we get there and talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about what the current market is from a uh, real estate perspective. Uh, Kent talked a lot about property management. On the home sales side, and I'm talking primarily retail home sales, um, in short, the Memphis market's booming. I mean, it, it baffles me a little bit as to how strong the retail sales market is in Memphis it was strong through the quarantine period. It's still strong, and I see no ev evidence of it slowing down or any type of price erosion whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> we continue to get call after call on the retail side. We are primarily an investor sale uh, company, but we do sell ho homes through retail, and we obviously mo monitor all the metrics throughout. And a lot of reasons for that um, are Clearly, I mean, in Memphis, we have very low home inventory. That's something that's kind of a, um, a byproduct of the downturn many years ago, and, that, and many of the home, uh, builders still have not uh, been able to create enough homes to meet the demand. But also here locally, <clears throat> you know, Memphis is a, a strong market fueled by logistics, manufacturing, medical, which are all essential services, and really none of those shut down during the quarantine period. Many essential services kept going on, and so I think we're you know, uh, feeling that um, preferable treatment, so to speak, or preferable outcome of you know this uh, COVID market or, or COVID time. Uh, as Kent mentioned, both Tennessee and Mississippi have both um, started reopening and we're saying, I mean, the traffic counts going up. I mean, people are back in the streets again and, and um, we're seeing demand continue to move forward strong with a strong, uh, very strong. So that kind of brings me back to what my focus is at here, which is really trying to meet demand <clears throat> and meet that demand and bring in the most investor leveraged subdivisions uh, to the table. If we look at what makes a good subdivision, you know, we primarily focus on, you know, items like solid demographics, high rent ratios, good employment and growth, low crime, good schools, a good Meridian history. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've, we've sold hundreds and hundreds of homes and each home <clears throat> we've tracked the, you know, birth through today, the, you know, uh, uh, history of it. And, you know, so we have very good data that tells us where the markets are that are strong. We also keep a keen eye towards areas where the local and state governments are investing. We found when these factors come together, <clears throat> appreciation of rents, home values, all become you know, highly likely making a long, good for long-term investment. We couple this with an analytic view of our property management performance, effectively looking at the hundreds of homes we've sold managed to determine what factors really contribute to better, better performance. 
Some cases, those factors are locational, like proximity to schools, shopping, work, etc. In other cases, it boils down to the type of house we build, beds, baths, layouts, and so on. So we're trying to pull all these different factors together to try to figure out where the next big win is. And, you know, we've been successful in doing that so far, and I think many of the results are self-evident as our, invest our investors have done very well to date in the COVID environment. When I talk to other property management comp companies, as Kent's mentioned, the results are not as good. <clears throat> You know, I feel that with the data we've collected from the last 12 years of investing in Memphis and our pen penetration in the communities here, we have a better understanding of Memphis, of the Memphis market than almost anyone. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the projects I'm currently working on, as it might give you an idea of, you know, the depth of you know, the research and such that goes into what makes for potentially the next, next investment you guys see. Been spending a lot of time pulling together a development in Bahalia, Mississippi. Um, Bahalia is typically or has been a, a sleepy town that was put on the map recently by two major items. Uh, the I-269 corridor, it's a, a new uh, interstate that basically circles around the west and south side of Memphis. And this new interstate has obviously created a, a number of new exchanges and exchange areas and has taken cities and t small towns that were previously a long ways, of, you know, made it hard for them to get into town and made it a lot easier for them to travel. <clears throat> Second thing that's going on around Bahalia is the uh, Marshall County, which is the county that Bahalia is in. Uh, uh, there's a place called the Chickasaw Trails Industrial Park. This park has been instrumental in putting Marshall County on the map in Mississippi. <clears throat> Marshall County has led state for the last two years in job growth and expects to continue the trend. This Chickasaw Trails Industrial Park is a rail hub. It's 15 minutes from a FedEx hub and has recently gained the following major companies in the past few years, Rockfin, Volvo, Post Cereal, Niagara Water, Nike, Kellogg's, Corel, and even Amazon. The last three companies alone account for over 2,000 jobs at the park in total, having well over 5,000 jobs that have been created in the last few years. Interestingly, there is no housing nearby. So they've created this gigantic park, industrial park, with all kinds of big-name companies rolling in, and there's very limited housing nearby. Bahalia and Collierville are the two closest cities. Collierville is a very high-end area. Homes there are $300,000, $500,000 plus, primarily an area where most of the upper-level managers are going to live. The hell is a worker community. Now, working hard to establish connections with state and local, local government officials to help determine the housing needs in the area. I've spent many meetings with a local Marshall County lobbyist, Gary Anderson, Spent time with the mayor, Phil Malone, <clears throat> state representative, Bill Kincaid, who's over Marshall County, and I've had multiple meetings with Tate Reeves as the governor of Mississippi, all of which have seen what's going on in Marshall County or, and are working to move government funds into the community to continue growth. Obviously, from a Meridian side, this is the place we want to be. The consist consensus by all is that Haley needs housing and a lot of it. <clears throat> Uh, we've worked tirelessly and have found one of only two real viable areas to develop that have access to public sewer and water <clears throat> and the city led by the mayor streamlining, stream, streamlining our application to develop so that we can meet the demand. Again, as a sleepy little city, much of what's going on in places like Bahalia, I mean, these are you know, little towns that have septic and well water. So there's very limited public works. And so that's why the government's been so involved. They're trying to expand that public works. But what we've found are, are some development areas that still tie into what limited public works is available. And as such, we'll be kind of first to the market. The project we're working on has over 300 lots. The project will last about four to five years and will be a combination of planned rental communities along with retail sales. So we're really excited about what's going on in Bahalia. And, you know, again, what we found is by, you know, kind of coordinating and working with the state and local governments, we can really get an eye for where they see value and try to jump on that terrain. 
to that end, you know, we are also working a 116 unit project in the Olive Branch. Uh, many of you know that Olive Branch, I mean, it's, it's one of our favorite communities. It's a proven city with great investor results. Uh, we're in the process now and over the next coming weeks, we'll be going to the city to get our plans approved for 50 single family homes that we'll be building in there, followed by 66 townhome units, both triplexes and quads. That will be for rent as well. The subdivision's next, uh, nestled next to a, a quiet yet higher end neighborhood just west of the newest, newly established Methodist Hospital and Medical Park. So we're really excited about this. Uh, this is something, as Kent mentioned, that should come on board late next year. And um, <clears throat> we also are working uh, to the uh, west a little further in a city called Walls, Mississippi. We're working on a 76 uh, unit community there. Uh, Walls is another community we anticipate will explode in the coming years. Uh, we found key ground there that we'll be developing later this year to serve the demand. Walls is an interesting little city that serves both Memphis, both the Memphis market, as well as the northern Mississippi market, South Haven and Olive Branch, as well as Tunica. And as many of you know, Tunica is kind of the heart of uh, gambling and casinos here in northern Mississippi, and many people that live in Walls actually find work there. A diversified neighborhood that has a housing shortage that we intend to uh, cure. So, you know, as part of trying to um, lay pipe, so to speak, for the future, for the Meridian's future, <clears throat> we've got well over what, about 550, 600 lots that we have under development right now that will that will be coming online next year and throughout the next four to five years to serve both our investor and retail market. That, I'd like to hand the baton over to Kevin. He'll be talking about the ha housing outlook nationally and how that national outlook compares to what we're seeing in Memphis. Okay, well, thanks, Jeff. Well, so we heard from Kent that, uh, you know, basically the uh, properties that we have under management seem to be performing well. You know, collections have been strong, leasing has been strong. Uh, Jeff's kind of talked about what's been happening in Memphis. Uh, you know, it's going back to work. Uh, and we are very busy, you know, as he said, laying pipe for the, uh, for the future here. So what I want to talk about now is just kind of the outlook, uh, you know, for real estate investment going forward. Uh, I'll start kind of with, a, you know, a national perspective and then kind of winnow it down uh, uh, more locally. You know, Kent was speaking of uh, national headlines being kind of dramatic. Okay, so you, you see, uh, you know, besides uh, you know, some rent challenges in markets uh, outside of Memphis. Uh, we're also seeing things like, you know, the you know real estate market down sharply or, you know, housing shortage it could become the worst in U.S. history, and, you know, things like that. And, you know, first blush, that's uh, that's a little disconcerting when you when you read the headlines. And, you know, broadly speaking, what they're saying is true in the sense that, uh, you know, right now listings are down by about half nationally. Uh, showings are down because of the, uh, uh, you know, quarantine orders and so on that are, that are in effect. And, uh, you know, consequently, sales volume has dropped, uh, you know, very significantly. So this is a, a really bad time to be a realtor. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you live, uh, you know, on retail real estate commissions, this is just not a good time. But as an investor, I'm far more interested in pricing and rent levels and what's going on in, in my, my local investment market. Uh, this week I was, uh, you, know, you know, reading news and uh, research reports and uh, uh, I'll, I'll just pull out realtor.com because they're, they're pretty well known, but uh, they're forecasting that prices in 2020 nationally are forecast to rise in 75% of the nation's largest metros but they will fall in some of the very largest ones and most dense ones. Uh, you know, think Chicago, uh, Dallas, Miami, Detroit. Prices will actually fall in those markets. But in 75% of them, they're going up. And the, the you know, metros that are going up are the ones that are left like Memphis. Uh, so, uh, you know, nationally, overall, prices are supposed to go up. 0.8%, but if in 25% of the metros they're falling, that means they're going to rise much more than that in, uh, you know, in these, uh, you know, less dense markets like Memphis. Okay, so why would that be happening? You know, some of the, 
you know, some of the big drivers of demand, uh, well, let's look at millennials. Uh, more millennials can afford to buy because, you know, what the heck, now they're uh, one year one year older, they're making more money. Uh, more of them are forming households as they get older, so more of them are getting married, having children. And with the COVID crisis, it's kind of changed the millennial outlook. Uh, in fact, I, I, I got a, uh, an article here that, uh, that says, uh, Coronavirus Causing Americans to Rethink City Life. Okay, so what's that mean? Okay, well, according to a Harris poll that came out in recent weeks, 30% of Americans have browsed online real estate listings and are considering moving to a less densely populated town. Uh, urbanites in particular are twice as likely as people living in non-urban settings to be searching for a new place to live. Okay, and why are they doing this? Okay, well, their desire is for more space you know, more personal space, you know, you know, within their home, and also access to more uh, outdoor activities. You know, they're, they're actually shifting away from, uh, you know, seeking experiences and are putting a premium on home lifestyle. So experiences are, you know, things like going out to, you know, interesting restaurants or going to art galleries and so on. But with people being confined at home, you know, particularly those with families, you know, think millennials, you know, with, with children, you can imagine the conversation, you know, hey, honey, <laughs> kids are driving me nuts. We're just too confined in this place. I don't care about having a communal gym anymore. I just don't want to have neighbors encroaching me anymore. we got to do something about this. So these are the people that are either going to buy or rent in the suburbs. And uh, you know, what, what we're seeing in Memphis, as uh, you know, both uh, Jeff and Kent have pointed out, is, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing corroboration of, uh, of this uh, shift to the suburbs. You know, retail sales have been strong, leasing's been active, uh, rents have remained strong, and now we're seeing investors, you know, picking up on the queue and, and in our investors now are buying again. Another big macro trend is, uh, you know, we've underbuilt single family homes for the, you know, for the, for the past 10 years. And, you know, we're supposed to be building about 1.4, you know, habitation units in this country per year. But during the Great Recession, there was almost no building going on for, or either no or low building for 10 years. And that's a hole that we've got to, got to fill in because, you know, the, the, the nation's, um, population is still growing, but we haven't kept up with the supply of housing to fulfill demand for, you know, this uh, population growth. Uh, if, if you read this newsletter that we sent out this past week, you saw me uh, quote uh, a guy named John Burns. Uh, he's, he's probably the preeminent, uh, you know, consultant to the uh, uh, real estate industry, you know, as, as far as uh, new construction goes. And uh, one of the things he said, and, and I quote, you know, it's our view, and it seems to be everybody's view, that single-family rental is going to be the first to stabilize and come out of this. You know, and he went on to say that the build-to-rent sector will be the very first segment to rebound as the low supply of newly built rental homes favors this sector, and, and that capital is seeking safety, yield, and a, a hedge against inflation that will come in. Okay, so, so again, these, these are the things that are, that are driving demand. Uh, you know, as uh, uh, Jeff pointed out, you know, Memphis has already started going back to work. Uh, you know, by my reckoning, they're probably three or four weeks ahead of where California is right now. You know, so the restaurants are open at 50% capacity now. Uh, again, they're, they're doing it in a, you know, smart way. I mean, they're, they're putting in all of the, you know, proper, you know, uh, social distancing measures and uh, so forth. But, uh, but but importantly, they, they have gone back to work. So again, going back to a question, you know, I often get asked is, you know, is now a good time to begin investing or, you know, should we, you know, just wait a little bit longer to see how, how this thing plays out? Well, let, let me just put it this way. You know, in my view, if getting the best pricing and best selection matters, then absolutely yes. Now, now is the time to do it. 
Okay, I mentioned the reasons why pricing is forecast to rise, and we, we, we've got an abundance of evidence, uh, you know, showing, you know, strength of demand in Memphis right now. Uh, a, a very significant thing that just uh, just occurred, you know, in, uh, you know, in the past 10 days is some of the major investment funds that kind of went dark, uh, you know, when the COVID crisis first hit. Uh, you know, they have resumed their activity. Uh, they are talking to us again. And these are the guys who buy in larger quantity. Okay, as Kent mentioned, uh, you know, right now we, we still have newly built inventory available, uh, you know, in some of our premium, air, premium areas, you know, like the uh, Memphis suburbs of Olive Branch and Oakland. But uh, yeah, like, like you said, we're not going to have anything more in Olive Branch until next year. And we, we just have a you know, handful of, of really good properties, you know, still available there. But in the past week, we sold over 25% of everything we, we have in inventory. And by the end of this month, we could well be supply constrained. So I, I would say, you know, arguably right now, the conservative decision is if, if you were uh, considering investing, I would be pulling the trigger earlier rather than later while I had the, you know, the best pricing and selection that was available. Now, if you're interested in following up on that more, uh, you know, please uh, reach out to Brian. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Brian. Oh, great. Thanks, Dad. Um, so let's move over to our Q&A portion of this. And Jordan, I know you've been tracking the questions. Would you please read off the first one? Absolutely. So the first question for the group we have says, what laws, if any, have been enacted for the state of Tennessee, Memphis, or Shelby County, which affect collections of rents, recovery of rent or non-payment, and enforcement of rental agreements and evictions? Yeah, and I'll take that one. We touched on that uh, early on. Um, you know, there was a rent moratorium, ex or excuse me, a uh, eviction moratorium that was extended to May 31st, mostly as a practical matter because the courts are closed. But all, all lease terms are in full force. There is no abatement of rents. And it just, it just hasn't been even a, an issue that comes up because everyone's paying their rents. So the, the, in this market, uh, that is just not uh, an issue. Okay. Nice, thanks, Ken. And uh, how about the second question, Jordan? Okay, second question. Has Memphis or Shelby County enacted any COVID-related landlord tenant local requirements that differ from any stipulations mandated by the state of Tennessee? Um, the question was, is, is Mississippi different than Tennessee? Was that the question? Um, they're very, they're very, well, let me just answer. <laughs> they're very similar, but again, uh, there are no government regulations that are hurting landlords at this point. All, all lease terms are in full force and rec collections are happening as they normally do. And, and that there is nothing on the horizon that is going to change that. Great. How about the next one? Okay, another question. Jeff, in checking the initial 2017 cost of our homes in both Northern Mississippi and Memphis, compared to the current quoted internet values over that three years, the prices appeared down about 10 to 15%. With the market being hot now, does that acquisition price versus present internet value comparative surprise you? Is it inaccurate? I can speak to that at least initially. So when looking online, typically people go, or at least we go to Trulia, Redfin, Realtor.com and Zillow. Um, and what we have found is that the, the prices can sometimes be accurate and sometimes be wildly inaccurate. So if you're interested in getting an accurate understanding as to what your current home values are, please reach out to me directly and we can perform um, what's similar to our own version of an appraisal using similar comps of certain properties in certain areas. Um, we'll do an analysis for you and give what we think is going to be the actual value of the home. Uh, we caution people from using, you know, things like Z estimate just because they actually have come out and really shared with everyone that they're accurate to a point, but there's limits in what those, uh, you know, softwares can calculate accurately. And if Brian, if I could add yeah, in, I'll just... oh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I was just going to kind of say something similar. Um, Mississippi is a non-disclosure state as well, which means that 
many sales are not posted, uh, nor do they have to be. So um, there's, you know, a lot of what Zillow polls is not, um, sometimes they can't get any data. Sometimes they get limited data. So Mississippi, anytime you do something in Mississippi with Zillow, it, the error rate's probably twice as bad as in a disclosure state. So to Brian's point, I mean, we'll, you know, we've got licensed realtors on staff that can pull uh, market analysis and compare and, and uh, comps and such on your properties. It would surprise me that properties would be 15% lower today than they were th three years ago. That would be very surprising. It's you know certainly possible, but um, uh, we'd love to do, you know, we'd love to do an analysis. Yeah. And I was just going to add, you know, we saw in general about a 5%, five to 6% increase last year in the property values. But as we were going through, I think a project Brian's going to mention our, our uh, portfolio performance reports, you know, when you, when you compare all the different uh, automated valuation systems, there's, there's always outliers. You kind of get the right value from one or two, and then there might be an outlier of one or two. And so we have to go sanity check that based on what we know is actually happening in those neighborhoods. And, and that's what leads to our more accurate, uh, more accurate projection of the value. Great, thank you guys. Uh, Jordan, let's move on to the next. Okay, um, next question is regard in regards to what we've been experiencing with lenders and banks over the last few months, are investors still able to leverage their investment dollars? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, at least I'll start us off. So the lending space has been going through interesting fluctuations over the past several weeks. In fact, there were a lot of loan products known as asset-based financing products, where it's basically a commercial loan on a single family residential property. A lot of those loan products have actually disappeared over the past several weeks. In fact, we had one client that was in the process of closing and in the midst of the escrow, the lender said that was providing asset-based financing. We're no longer offering this service and we had to cancel the, the contract then and there. Um, so that's been something that's kind of reshaping the, the asset-based financing world. As far as conventional financing goes, Fannie and Freddie uh, have been tightening their loan or underwriting um, process, so they're not giving loans out as easily or as quickly, but they're still available to get. Uh, in fact, I'm noticing that there's a big spread between which lenders are willing to provide financing for investment properties versus which ones aren't as comfortable with it. So. I've seen rates as high as five and a half to 6% being quoted for single family residential, 25% down. Um, and I've also seen quotes as low as three and three eighths for that same exact loan product, uh, the same exact percent down. So right now what we're suggesting is not all lenders are created equal and you really wanna find the lenders that are gonna be able to provide you with the best rates and service. Um, we have a collection of those. So if you're looking to shop rates, I do recommend reaching out to me because I can give you some other referrals and references to get price quotes from. Um, okay. Anyone else want to add anything about the financing world? Yeah, yeah. B bottom line, financing is available if it's a Fannie and Freddie back, uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie back loan, which most that's what most people get, you know, unless they're uh, uh, not, not eligible for some reason, but uh, most people are. So it shouldn't be a problem. And I think there was one more question from Ted there, Jordan. Yeah, we have a couple more. So um, as leases near expiration, are you seeing tenants looking to extend their current leases rather than moving? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, you know, there was for a period of time there, a couple of months, there was a real hunker down mentality. And yeah, we did have some tenants want to extend their leases. Uh, what we're finding though, conversely to that is a lot of tenants are actually wanting to buy their property. So if you might be getting calls from our property managers, uh, the tenants are interested in buying, which is a wonderful opportunity for you as the investor to get a very small uh, transaction fee uh, to um, sell the home directly to, to the current tenant and then flip it into a new home through a 1031 exchange. So there, it looks like more of those opportunities are happening right now uh, as people have had a, a good experience with Meridian in a new home and now they want to, and, and because we go after high quality tenants, a lot of them are qualified to become buyers. And so there, there's going to be more and more of that opportunity for our investors to sell the home they have and then 1031 exchange into a new 
uh, property and you know reap some of the profits uh, without much of a tax, barely any tax consequence, and reinvest it. Yeah, I'd like to add just a little bit. I, I think we've also seen that um, <clears throat> renewals are up. Uh, during this time, I mean, people have not really gone out to go necessarily find a new place to live. So as their leases were up, they actually wanted to extend it or just renewed for another year, which obviously winds up helping the investor by uh, avoiding some sort of, you know, vacancy period. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And the last question we have for those investors who are never seller, long holders like myself, and the notion of assuming more long term, low fixed rate leverage to purchase more properties, now a valid premise based on a possible inflationary environment due to helicopter drop bed bailouts. How about a deflationary period? Hey, can you repeat the question again? That's a. Uh... Yeah, that, that... Sorry, yeah. yeah, sorry, it's in the Q&A from Matthew Murray. Um, for those investors who are never seller, long-term holders like myself, in the notion of assuming more long-term low fixed rate leverage to purchase more properties, now a valid premise base on a possible inflationary environment due to helicopter drop fit bailout, how about a deflationary period? Okay, well, well let, let, let me try and take take a stab at that. You know, first off, uh, lever leveraging is the way you maximize your internal rate of return because you're controlling an asset that's very valuable uh, uh, relative to the amount of capital that you're putting in to control it. Uh, that's that's why you're able to acquire um, you know more more assets with a fixed amount of fixed amount of money. So leveraging is good. You know, putting 25% down and buying multiple homes instead of paying cash for say one home. So uh, you know leverage is good. Now as a hedge against uh, inflation, I mean that's that's one of the most attractive things about real estate. And I can tell you that uh, since we have just uh, uh, you know had what more than $2 trillion worth of bailout money. That money came from some, somewhere. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're gonna go through a, a period where, where since we've grown our national debt as much as we have, we're gonna have to start paying it back. And what you, uh, uh, you know, what, what they are projecting is longer term, we are more likely to enter an inflationary period than a deflationary period. Uh, again, time, <clears throat> Time will tell. Uh, you, when you enter a period of uh, deflation, you know all, all bets are off. But uh, at least reading the uh, the economic news right now, you know the likelihood of entering a deflationary period is is, uh, is fairly uh, fairly low. Uh, the economy is going to be recovering over time, and it may be a little herky jerky for a while. You know, it, you know, especially if we have any uh, you know relapses and have to re-implement uh, uh, distancing sanctions. But even if we were to do that, it's not going to be for a long time. It'll be for long enough to get it under control. And then then, then we'll ease back back into uh, you know, full employment again. Uh, how long that's gonna take, uh, there are just too many variables to accurately predict that. I, you know, personally, I'm guessing you know, one to two years before, before we will feel uh, you know, more of a normal employment uh, environment, but that depends on how quickly we get a vaccine and, you know, a whole bunch of other factors. But there are a lot of things that for the long term, I think are, are going, going to be supportive of real estate. And, and the one thing that, that I always keep in mind is real estate is a basic need. I mean, next to food, people want shelter. And if they have capital, that I mean, those are the two things in their lives that they're going to use their capital for is that food and that shelter at the expense of almost everything else. So uh, again, with, with real estate being a good hedge against inflation and uh, with the you know, general economic outlook being favorable uh, with this stimulus uh, money actually working right now, I mean, it's actually having the desired effect, uh, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. 
Yeah, I'll add that, uh, you know, Matt, it's a really good question. I'll add that in this current economic state, um, if you're able to qualify for refinancing, we recommend doing so, especially for these long-term holders. There's an opportunity to actually do a cash out refi and invest in more properties or even just have a more liquid portfolio. And I do think that it's worth at least shopping rates to see if you can improve upon what you already have. Um, we talk a lot to investors about wanting to maximize their return on equity. And for a lot of people, that means after every five or 10 years, they either want to sell a home and, you know, sell one home and buy two or pull out money via a cash out refi and then use that money to buy another home. That's kind of the the trick to maximizing wealth creation and driving internal rate of return. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's an excellent point, Brian. I, I, personally, I think I'm exhibit A you know, someone that did that. I mean, I started investing in real estate in, in my early, uh, early twenties. And it, uh, uh, you know, the, the strategy was acquire real estate, let it run for a few years, do a cash out refinance and, uh, uh, you know, use that refi money to acquire more real estate. So one house became two, became four, became eight, became 16. I mean, that that's literally, what occurred, you know, in my, when I was in my twenties, my thirties, my forties, my fifties. <laughs> and uh, this is a really good time to execute that strategy, particularly, particularly for those investors who, you, you know, bought four or five years ago, you probably got enough equity in there to, uh, you know, harvest it through a cash out refinance and use that cash you pull out tax free because you didn't buy or sell anything. Right tax-free money and redeploy it in, uh, in more real estate. That's exactly what I did most of my life. And I, I'd encourage you to consider it if you're in a position to do that. That's the nice thing about having cash flowing assets is people aren't forced to sell in the midst of a downturn. So as right. long as people are never forced to sell, it's always good to have real estate to play the long-term game on. All right, any other questions from, um, our attendees or any other comments from our presenters? Uh, I, I think before we close, Brian, why don't you give your contact information? Because uh, people have asked about that. Yes, I just entered it actually in the text box here. So it's my first initial of my first name and then my last name, B Conlin at meridianpack.com. Um, so you're welcome to reach out to me at any point there. Uh, something I do want to give everyone the heads up about is we're in the process of launching uh, the portfolio performance review um, project, I guess you can call it. Ultimately, what we've been doing is since the start of 2014, when it, we've been able to actually track each investor's returns, factoring in uh, you know, cash flow, debt, pay down, and appreciation of their property to give people a comprehensive understanding and view as to how their properties have performed over time. So over the next several weeks, we're gonna be reaching out to the investors and, and providing a report uh, and answering any questions you may have about it. So that's kind of a preview of coming attractions. If you wanna get yours sooner rather than later, feel free to reach out to me and I can make sure to prioritize you and, and move you up the list. So um, with that being said, I uh, really appreciate you all for being here and uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions or would like to request any follow-up information. And Brian, just so you know, we actually do have one more question. Oh, nice, from Cecilia. Um, question reads, do you think it is wise to place your loan in forbearance if you are planning to retire in the future? I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. <clears throat> um, you've got to be real careful uh, with the forbearance, and I would check into your bank very carefully. Some banks um, have, you know, uh, basically gone out and they will not put it on your credit rating or any of that. They publicize that. And, and, you know, as I've seen it, that's what they've done. I know banks like Wells Fargo have a good program, uh, but some will forego those, but they're still reporting it to your credit agencies and things of that nature. And so you've really got to make sure you understand what the, how your uh, bank is going to process that forbearance uh, before you go down that path. Cause you certainly don't want to risk any type of bad credit situation from it. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say if you if you have a, a, a definitive economic need where you really need to do it, uh, you know, de definitely pursue it. But if you don't absolutely need it, I wouldn't do it. I, I think the conservative approach is is, is to you know just, uh, if you have the means to do so, uh, keep keep paying. Uh, it, it, 
I just don't think it's worth the credit risk that that could occur that Jeff was speaking to. Yeah. Great. All right. If there's no other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. So just so everyone knows, a link will be sent out over the upcoming week with a actual a link to our YouTube page where this will be rebroadcast. So if you miss anything or want to follow up or re-listen to it, you're welcome to do so there. Yeah. Uh, thanks again, you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Please, if you have uh, topics that you would like us to speak to uh, in these communications with you, please, uh, please let Brian know about that, Brian or Jordan. Uh, so, so that we can speak to the things that you're you're especially uh, interested in. But again, thank you, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys, take good care. Be safe. Stay healthy. Right. Talk soon. All right. Thank Goodbye. You. Bye, guys. Bye.